the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. A social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. The Case for an Anarchist Exploration of Doctor Who by John Bigger. Since Doctor Who began in 1963, the drama has become one of the most written about programmes in the world. In its early years, this came from newspaper column inches, but as the longevity of the programme increased, the writing widened. By the mid-1970s, Doctor Who had acquired a fandom, organising, amongst other things, DIY fanzines. By the end of that decade, a dedicated official magazine began publication, and it still continues to explore every facet of the programme. The first major scholarly work on the drama came in 1983, Doctor Who, The Unfolding Text by John Tullock and Manuel Alvarado was published in the field of cultural studies. It was both a case study of the unfolding narrative of Doctor Who and a textbook of television studies. The programme was officially rested by the BBC in 1989 and despite a one-off TV movie made in 1996, didn't return to our screens regularly until 2005. Since then it has become a global phenomenon increasing the volume of written material inspired by it. There has been an explosion of scholarly material on the subject, mainly in media and cultural studies. In addition, there have been publications assessing Doctor Who from both a scientific and a philosophical basis. Worthy of special mention are two series of books delving deep into the programme. The first is the Black Archive series by Obverse Books, focusing on specific Doctor Who stories, The second is the About Time series, published by Mad Norwegian Press and providing perhaps as total a history of Doctor Who as anyone is likely to need. Both series benefit from excellent levels of research and I must confess that keeping up with them is a challenge. Thus far in the many chronicles of Doctor Who publishing, there has been nothing noteworthy that combines Doctor Who with anarchism. In this essay, I put the case for an anarchist exploration of Doctor Who. The possibilities for such an exploration are about as endless as the unfolding narrative of the programme itself. It's hard to sum up Doctor Who in a couple of sentences for those that are not acquainted with it, but here goes. In essence, it is a drama in which the main protagonist, the Doctor, can find themselves on any planet and in any time period, lending to remarkably high possibilities for adventure and drama, at least in theory. The Doctor travels in a space and time machine called a TARDIS, The longevity of the drama was secured when it was decided to replace the original actor, William Hartnell, with Patrick Troughton and change the personality of the character at the same time. This process has been woven into the history of Doctor Who as regeneration, a feature of Time Lord physiology, the Doctor being a Time Lord. There have been 13 actors to play the central character on TV so far. I'm not going to give a detailed history of the programme and the phases that it has been through or the currents that have influenced it. I'm going to focus now on the scope for an anarchist exploration of the programme. The reason I use the word exploration in this essay is to emphasise that this is about uncovering areas for anarchist discussion in relation to Doctor Who. This essay doesn't suggest that the programme is itself anarchist in any way. My own interest in it comes from my personal experience as a Doctor Who fan and as an anarchist. I've been watching the programme since 1979 and over that time I've watched most of the stories multiple times. In recent years, as my understanding and knowledge of anarchism has grown, I've noticed that I've started to watch familiar stories and see something new in them. My anarchism has led me to interpret the stories differently. My own anarchist exploration of the programme has also coincided with reading some comments relating to Doctor Who in the late 1980s by those involved with making it. In 1987, Sylvester McCoy became the seventh Doctor. It coincided with a new script editor in Andrew Cartmel joining the production team. At his interview for the position, Andrew Cartmel was asked what he hoped to achieve with Doctor Who. His answer was to overthrow the government, at that time under the leadership of Margaret Thatcher. The foreword to Cartmel's memoirs is written by McCoy, 
who explains that they both hit it off immediately. He writes that Andrew was against the establishment and in favour of a healthy measure of anarchy. Cartmel himself was interviewed in Doctor Who magazine number 545 from November 2019 and was asked to comment on a view held by one of his predecessors, Terence Dix, who was script editor from 1968 to 1974. Interviewed in Doctor Who magazine number 508, Dix had stated that the Doctor should be British, middle or upper class, and a gentlemanly hero. This conjures up an image of an imperialist figure civilising wherever he finds himself. Cartmel did not agree. He said, To cite an example from before my time, Tom Baker's Doctor, the fourth, isn't a British Empire figure. He's a British eccentric figure. He's not the sort of person they'd have in the East India Company. He's an anarchist. And that's true of most incarnations of the Doctor. I still see Sylvester sometimes. We do the odd convention together. And anarchic is the word. He tears the room apart. Talk about dismantling systems. It's wonderful. He's hilarious. And he has that anarchy in him, which is essential to the character. Far from being an imperialist, the Doctor is a total anarchist. In the Happiness Patrol, he topples a regime in a single night. It is fair to say that The Happiness Patrol, written by Graham Curry and broadcast in 1988, is a good example of the anarchism of the Seventh Doctor. Hearing of a planet in which sadness, melancholy and the blues are outlawed, the Doctor sets out to provide people with the freedom to be unhappy. Meanwhile, patrols scour the streets for people who aren't smiling sufficiently. The story also contains a villain based on Margaret Thatcher, so the story enables Cartmel to live up to his bold claim at his job interview, at least in fiction. However, Cartmel also raises the issue of the anarchic and appears to conflate the word with anarchist. Taking that aside, his statement that most incarnations of the Doctor are anarchists is worth pursuing. All incarnations have a healthy disdain for authority figures. They tend to support the oppressed. The Doctor often encourages revolution, insubordination, sabotage and rebellion. They inspire and empower collective action. Cartmel's desire to use a family science fiction show to bring down the government might have been a tad naive, but it hints at wider issues regarding the possibilities and limitations of mainstream drama. The first producer of Doctor Who, Verity Lambert, said the following... I think the whole thing about Doctor Who, and one of the reasons why kids really responded to him, he was completely anti-establishment, and they could actually relate to the fact that he was an anti-authoritarian. She didn't think the programme had taken the right route, when it later contained the third incarnation of the Doctor being an advisor for the military. It is worth noting, though, the Doctor retains an anti-establishment vibe in many of the stories where they are associated with both the military and or the government. It is a point of conflict within the drama, and something that keeps the action moving, as the central character tries to convince those around them that the way forward does not have to be oriented towards a military solution. It would be stretching the point, though, to describe the central character as consistently anarchist. Stephen Moffat was showrunner from 2010 to 2017, and he maintains that the Doctor is for everyone, In a Blu-ray documentary, he said, If the Doctor was only one thing, he'd only appeal to those people. He went on. If you happen to be a high old Tory, well, so is the Doctor. If you happen to be a revolutionary, well, so is the Doctor. He describes the process of characterising the Doctor as absorbing all the best values of everything and making them into one person. And explains that this is a mass appeal show. It has to appeal to all sides of the argument. You can't just be the left-wing show or the right-wing show. In addition to an anarchist exploration of the central character of the programme, we can also focus attention on individual stories. Every Doctor Who story shown on television has been subject to multiple reviews. They just keep coming. There is scope also for reviews of stories from an anarchist perspective. In fact, I would argue that every story could be viewed through an anarchist lens, revealing new insights. Most Doctor Who stories are about liberation in some form or another. In The Three Doctors, written by Bob Baker and Dave Martin and broadcast in 1973, for example, the first three incarnations of the Doctor joined forces to fight the evil Time Lord Omega at the nucleus of a black hole. Omega is trapped and he wants his freedom. The Time Lords need the Three Doctors to help them, 
because Omega is sapping their energy in his bid for freedom. The whole story is about freedom. However, the human beings that get caught up in this adventure just really want to get home from the black hole so that they can go about their business. In this story, freedom is for Time Lords, power is for Time Lords. The humans seem to lack agency. They get home, they get back to work. This era of the programme was presided over by one of the most creative teams in Doctor Who history. I have already mentioned the conservative approach of Terence Dix in his description of the Doctor. Dix was a pragmatic script editor and only changed storylines by the writers if he felt they didn't work. His producer, Barry Letts, wanted stories to be about something. Dix stuck to that principle even when it went against his own politics. In the era they were responsible for, Doctor Who had a number of stories that Dix may well have disagreed with. He has spoken publicly, for example, about the mutants, again by Bob Baker and Dave Martin from 1973, Set in the future on an Earth colony, it's a story that more than hints about the British pulling out of India. Dix took the view that British Empire did some good things in India. The story does not provide that impression, and Dix allows it that freedom, as it shows a governor desperately clinging to power. Letts, meanwhile, was fascinated by Zen Buddhism and the environment, writing a number of scripts highlighting these themes. Letts once said, I like to think that the Doctor looked at life in a Zen way. Dix also brought in his friend Malcolm Hulk, a former member of the Communist Party, to write stories. His script, Invasion of the Dinosaurs from 1974, concerned a group of conservative environmentalists wanting to really get back to basics. Their basic plan was to destroy life on Earth and then transport a select group of human beings back in time to begin again presumably without any of the terrors that industrialization brings, such as trade unions. In this story, there were literal dinosaurs, but under the surface there were also metaphorical dinosaurs, reversing industrial progress and eroding the opportunity for working-class consciousness. In many ways, whether the stories were set on Earth, in the present, or on planets in the future, in this era they were always about the here and now. Letts and Dix moved on in 1975, but Doctor Who since then has nearly always been about something. Some Doctor Who stories are much more overtly political than others. In the fourth Doctor story, The Sunmakers, written by Robert Holmes and broadcast in 1977, the workers of a future colony on Pluto are taxed by their company stroke government to the point of abject poverty. Taxation isn't generated on Pluto to fund services, but rather to feed the company hierarchy. Despite its theme of taxation, this is not a story written from a new right position. The story ends with a successful workers' revolution when the tax collector is bundled off a skyscraper to his death by a cheering mob. This was a bold move for a programme going out in the late afternoon with a large child audience. On this occasion, the revolution was televised, and seen by 8.4 million people. The Doctor resists the opportunity to help the humans forge a new society, leaving them to work that out for themselves, without rulers, without leaders. I have seen the story described as the closest Doctor Who gets to Marxism-Leninism, but it is far more libertarian than that. When the show returned in 2005 under showrunner Russell T Davies, several stories contained villains or monsters whose primary purpose for villainy or monstrousness was to make money. In the end of the world from that year, the villain plans to create a hostage situation with her seeming to be one of the victims in order to benefit from compensation. In another story that year, some villains just want to blow the planet up to sell us rubble. In addition, the dastardly Slitheen also pose as British politicians and declare that aliens threaten the planet with massive weapons of destruction. Coming just two years after the start of the Iraq War, it shows that Doctor Who also has a capacity for satire. In The Green Death, written by Robert Sloman and Barry Letts, broadcast in 1973, the Doctor faces giant maggots down a Welsh coal mine. It unfolds that the maggots are mutations caused by industrial waste in a story that predicts climate disaster through the capitalist system. It also contains a computer that intends to link up with others to create a world wide web in order to control global capitalism and therefore humanity. The abbreviation made up from the initials of the computer system is BOSS. We are left in no doubt that we are threatened as a species by the boss. 
If a worldwide computing system feels ahead of its time for the mid-1970s, the internet was predicted in Doctor Who first time round in The War Machines, written by Robert Banks Stewart and broadcast in 1965. Another story predicting climate catastrophe came in 2020. Orphan 55, written by Ed Heim, provides a glimpse of a possible future for humanity in the monstrous dregs a realisation of evolution in a carbon dioxide-rich environment. It is a story that emphasises prefiguration by showing us that our actions today will decide how the story pans out in reality. Another story with prefiguration at its heart is Day of the Daleks, written by Lois Marx, broadcast in 1972. It concerns a group of guerrilla soldiers from the future who arrive in the 1970s with the intention to blow up a peace conference. They have pinpointed the conference as the moment that led to a world war, during which the dreaded Daleks invaded and colonised Earth. It emerges that it was in fact the bombing of the conference that directly led to war breaking out, creating a great little paradox narrative where the guerrillas directly create the future they wish to avoid. It also suggests wider issues around ends and means. In Midnight, written by Russell T Davis and broadcast in 2008, a small group of tourists is trapped on a tiny shuttle under attack from some hostile entity. The Tenth Doctor, played by David Tennant, tries to organise them into a group that could fight back, using their collective brain power. Reasonably, one of the tourists asks why the Doctor has suddenly assumed power. What unfolds is a story containing a developing direct democracy, with all the implications that implies. The story shows how it can unravel quickly as a consensus builds around the fear the tourists have that the Doctor has been possessed by the entity. The solution seems clear to them. They can save themselves by ejecting the Doctor from the ship into the unbreathable atmosphere. It shows how democracy can become mob rule and hints at the potential terrors of a lack of guiding principles in decision-making. It shows how people can be influenced through fear and through articulate orators. It combines the tyranny of the majority with the tyranny of structurelessness and claims we should be wary of both. Another theme of Doctor Who is pacifism. The central character tends not to shoot their way out of problems, they tend to think their way through issues. Pacifism in Doctor Who was reframed in 2005 when the show returned from its BBC-imposed rest. The ninth Doctor, played by Christopher Eccleston, was a battle-scarred warrior who had emerged over time had been responsible for ending a bitter war between the Time Lords and the Daleks. The only way the war could be stopped was by the Doctor destroying both, giving this and subsequent incarnations an acute darkness. The character's guilt became a key part of their regained pacifism. We later discovered that the genocide hadn't actually worked and that both civilizations had survived. In July 2017, the show took a different turn when Jodie Whittaker was announced as the first woman to take on the central role in Doctor Who. The production team, under new showrunner Chris Chibnall, announced that the drama would be inclusive. The most recent series went by the tagline, Space for All. The stories took on a more deliberate purpose and have included themes such as plastic pollution, mental ill health, US civil rights and the partition of India. For some, Doctor Who has become the essence of wokeness. The idea that Doctor Who in its current incarnation is a programme for the woke is highly questionable, though. In Kerblam, written by Pete McTeague from 2018, the Doctor and friends receive a distress call and find themselves in an Amazon-like warehouse, but in space and in the future. What develops is a seemingly sympathetic look at the plight of workers in such an environment, That is, until it transpires that one of the workers is involved in sabotage that would result in the death of many people. The distress call actually originated not from an employee, but from the company's computerised management, known as The System. The doctor informs the worker causing all the trouble that the systems aren't the problem. How people use and exploit the system, that's the problem. This sentiment that people could forge a better capitalism implies reform rather than the dismantling of systems that the Seventh Doctor enjoyed or the bundling of capitalists of skyscrapers viewers enjoyed in 1977. The issue of woke in Doctor Who has resulted in some founders using the hashtag NotMyDoctor in relation to Jodie Whittaker. 
the show does currently promote a socially liberal outlook. At the same time, it has avoided the regime change style stories of the past. As Darren Mooney wrote earlier this year in the Escapist magazine, Doctor Who is more conservative than it has been in decades. It respects the police, it tempers the Doctor's anarchist tendencies, and it largely rejects dramatic, systemic or social change. Fandom as a whole is another suitable area for exploration. There are Doctor Who fan groupings around the world. Some are in semi-organised federations, such as the Doctor Who Appreciation Society local group system, whilst others are unfederated. Some I've come across have quite strong leadership figures at the centre, and others are much less hierarchical. A healthy zine culture still exists in fandom, alongside a vibrant social media scene. Whilst we can't say that Doctor Who is about anarchism, and whilst we can't say that the central character is undoubtedly an anarchist, we can look towards Doctor Who and find an awful lot to say about it in relation to anarchism. We can explore that central character further, their desires for freedom, their apparent willingness to always support the oppressed. We can explore each individual story and explain how it relates to us as anarchists. Fans can be proprietorial about their thing. For those that are Doctor Who fans and anarchists, are we comfortable with our programme? How does it make us feel? What would we like it to do if it continually fails to overthrow real governments? What can we learn about anarchism through Doctor Who fandom? These are the questions I raise. Now I'm going to end this essay, but begin to explore the ideas. There will be others, other ideas, other anarchist Doctor Who fans. I welcome the chance to start this conversation. I encourage those interested to begin their own exploration on the topic. An anarchist exploration of Doctor Who could run and run, just like the programme itself. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.